Well, dears, good morning. Um, as usual with these meetings, I start off really and truly not knowing what to say. I have nothing prepared. I don't have a talk at all. So, the infallible way to give me confidence, and I recommend the practice for you also when you are in a predicament like this, is just be still. Feet on the floor, bottom on the chair, listen and look. And lo and, lo and behold, almost miraculously we find this silence, this stillness, this all-embracing space. And, and uh, they're just bringing a bit more drinks for us. And this also takes place without disturbing the presence of this stillness. You see the little passing things around and little words this and that. But try not to lose this stillness, you see. It's a marvellous discovery that without changing or disturbing this stillness at all, all the actions of the world can take place within it. So these two aspects to every situation there is that which is changing and that which is not changing. It's so, so simple, isn't it? Let's take a, let's take a moment. You hear the voices downstairs, don't you? And we've all got some sort of body movement going on, our breathing, and that's happening. And yet here is this, I repeat the phrase, all-embracing stillness. And a very, another alternative, very nice word for this is presence. Well, you see, we're being attentive now, and it's become more stronger, hasn't it? Or has it become stronger, or have we become more open to it, more receptive of it? Because does it actually change at all? It's we that change, isn't it? footsteps coming up the stairs and the stillness is undisturbed, isn't it? We all a bit curious, we want to see who it is. But actually this takes place within stillness, doesn't it? And that really in a nutshell is our entire work. Because the more we attend to this stillness, the bigger it gets. The more we attend to this, the bigger it gets. It almost sort of draws us in, doesn't it? Come, come. It's an open door, an invitation. And as we move in that direction, somehow this gets rather less, doesn't it? Which reminds me of the words of John the Baptist talking about Jesus. 
I must decrease and he must increase. Here again, a little movement and noises as someone comes out of the toilet, walks past. Stay with the stillness. People are drinking their tea. Look at me, I'm going to drink mine now. You make sure I do this in perfect stillness. Just hold that stillness. seems quite absurdly simple, but actually the more we explore this, it's extraordinary that the revelations are without end. And the countless words that have been used throughout history to describe it. But in essence it's as simple as here now, and I'll use this word in presence, there is the eternal, because the presence, obviously, the stillness, it doesn't change, does it? It's eternal. The eternal and the transitory, that which comes to pass. Once upon a time, in a little calf in a little town called Bakewell, in England, <coughs> a dozen people sat around a table and listened to a man called John. Hmm? Once upon a time. <laughs> Just like a story, isn't it? And there's John lying in his grave in the churchyard. <laughs> his name on the gravestone. By then, you may all be getting a bit nearer it yourself. <laughs> That's what we call history, my dears. His story, his or her story. Once upon a time, it came to pass. And all the time, this eternal presence is, is what? Is present. Well, of course, if we are interested, we can, as we go deeper and deeper and deeper into it, we may find it's, we get so close to it, it becomes, you don't really, not quite sure whether you belong there or here. We actually feel more comfortable here than in here. So really we have the choice to stay rather small and limited and transitory with life ebbing out like this. We call it me, don't we? Me and my life. The great question is really, what do we want? What are we looking for in life? It's a really good, good question. You can't ask yourself too often. What do you really, really want? What's your heart's desire?
because it all start. This work starts. You, you've got to want it, otherwise, of course, you'll stay here. Most people probably do, more or less. Well, everybody sort of wants a bit more, usually. And again, there's so many words out there which probably are all more or less the same thing, because after all, what is the difference between freedom in this context? Here you could talk, it's obviously not free, is it? Here we're like in a little prison, in a little box. Oh, in contrast, this seems free. Here is disturbance, agitation movement. This is stillness, is another word for peace, isn't it? Freedom, peace. What about love? We're all of us insatiable for love, aren't we? We never get enough of it. The great thing that drives us. What about, can we really imagine what it is, love that never says no? Come, come unto me, beloved. Isn't that all what we all long for? Come home, where you belong. And where does each of these peace, freedom, love, where does one end and the other begin? Aren't they all really the same thing? Different aspects of the same thing? And what is spirit and what is God? We don't really need to define it, do we? There are really two ways of appreciating this intellectually with the head and with the heart, or a mixture of both, which, yes, for most of us it's a bit of both, isn't it? The head or the heart, some of us may be a bit more one way or the other, but it's all more or less muddled together, isn't it? Some of us are more active in our pursuit of this than others. Another lovely word for it is rest. To rest. What is rest? Let go. Interest. We can't get it, can we? All we can really do is receive it. It's a gift.
yesterday someone was talking about um, the difficulties of uh, forgiveness. Now may I just suggest to you that just to be present, just to rest in this presence is forgiveness. not only for ourselves, but for the whole predicament into which this world has fallen. And all that seems so wrong to us, past, present, and no doubt in the future too, all held in this ultimate forgiveness. Come, my beloved, Come home, where we belong. And is it all here, present, now? How can we be closer to this than here and now? The whole work of meditation is to help us let go of not being present because if you think about it carefully or just watch yourself and consider yourself you'll find that almost the entire day is spent in absence from this we are simply not present extraordinary isn't it talk about looking a gift horse in the mouth mm -hmm. <laughs> you know all this abundance is, is here available and we simply don't take it. And so we have problems. We never have enough of whatever it is we're longing for. And eventually we just run out of life itself. Hence death comes into the world. Well, my dear friends, isn't it extraordinary that 20 minutes ago I sat here and I had no idea what to say to you. So where's all this come from? It's extraordinary. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe when we're, at least, I don't say even claim to to be present, but at least I'm trying. I made a few steps in that direction, and it itself bears witness, doesn't it? It just is self-evident if we just focus on it. Because what have I described? But what is here present? And you all recognize it, each one of you, don't you? Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to drink my tea for a bit. And if any of you would like to ask anything, then go ahead. <coughs> I'm just looking out of the window now. <coughs> There's that, there's a, a hill outside the window. The hill sort of comes halfway up the window, and there's a, there's a, there's a roof, a nice stone tiled roof, and then there's a trees, and then there's the sky. I think from a very early age, I was born in the country, and I'm used to looking at the horizon, and just you know looking over there. I always found that. Very comforting. I like to do that. You see, instinctively, I, you ask me a difficult question. What do I do? My eyes look out of the window. <laughs> and, and that sense of the... I don't know how did it enter into me as a little boy, as a young boy. I don't know how it did, but I think there must have been some sort of instinctive comfort in, in looking into something bigger, into the sky, into the horizon. Yes, perhaps that expresses it quite well. What did I do, dear? Here we are. We're, this is the world of problems, isn't it? Of, of, of unhappiness and limitation and can't get on with anybody. And, and anything that does this is normally a comfort. It's, it's, it's welcome, isn't it, to us? Not well, everybody has a nice view to look at out of the window, so you might switch on the telly or something. But even that, in a sense, is a, takes you out of this, doesn't it? It, it puts you into a, another world. So perhaps that's what we all instinctively do throughout our, throughout our lives. Then we find that some things work better than others. Um, just looking at endless films on the telly is sort of okay to a point, but <laughs> get fed up with it after a bit, don't you? I think that's the answer, John. I just uh I turned to whatever I could that was bigger. I think I always found that of more comfort than human answers. The reality of... Yes, that also was important, instead of just sort of talking it over with a friend. I never really had few, if any, friends that I could really share my heart with. Um, I don't think it was that I particularly liked being alone or liked being quiet, but I didn't really like the alternative, really. I found company often in a way well it's difficult to say isn't it we're, we're such a mixture of so many different things perhaps I've said enough the more we consider human behavior you'll see that most of it is really pretty robotic it's automatic isn't it the current phrase is conditioned. From the day we're born, <coughs> and God knows probably before we're born, we pick up conditioning, don't we, from our parents, from the social climate we're born into. Um, <coughs> you know, a very typical example is greeting. How are you? I'm fine. 
you know, or is anything, could anything be more robotic than that, you know? <laughs> yes, it happens him, you know, constantly throughout the day. It sort of gets one through, but... Hmm. So... <coughs> We rather overestimate the whether we, in fact we choose anything very much in life, really. Most of our choices are conditioned to say the least, aren't they? Is he considered us? See, we've drifted away from it a bit, this presence, haven't we? We've lost the, the impact of it. You see, did we choose to drift away from it? We just started talking and perhaps I was a bit inattentive and we all were and so we've fallen away from it. It just happened, didn't it? Because this is what's our normality. We're not normally uh, connected in any great degree to this presence. We're normally absent from the presence. If we really understood the significance of being present, would we be absent? But we don't understand it, do we? We are conditioned to be absent, to be, as it were, lost sheep wandering around without a shepherd. That's how Jesus describes us, lost sheep. <coughs> What is it that brings us all together? What brought you here? <coughs> Hard to say, isn't it? <coughs> First, oh, it's a nice a nice word. Thirst, my dears. Thirst for the living waters. For that which really satisfies. I suppose that's pretty much how it starts, doesn't it? Perhaps that's a bit of an answer, a bit more of an answer to your question, Joan. That young man's yearning <coughs> for <coughs> what he couldn't put into words. <coughs> and as life presented one answer after another, somehow it didn't quite satisfy. There was always thirst for this indefinable more. How did we, how did we get it? How does a child grasp out at another sweet? Everyone does, don't they? <clears throat> Mummy, I want more, I want more love, don't we? <clears throat> well, obviously something has brought you here, you must want something you find here, young, because you've been here several times before. Loneliness, all forms of unhappiness, depression are well they sharpen up our desire for this something. God knows, dear. But here I think of, of again, the, the, the Bible is full of these lovely phrases. God calls us. We are called, aren't they? Those words of, is it Eliot? We sh with, the, with the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be 
to find where we started from. Is it something like that? And know the place for the first time. That's just about it, isn't it? Yes, you're quite right. You always, you point out that I'm of a rather melancholic disposition, <laughs> and others <laughs> start off have a more cheerful approach to life. Um, so I speak from my experience, but uh, obviously you're right. Of course you are. I was on the radio. I was listening this morning. Apparently, the um, there's a great big uh, Roman Catholic gathering in Portugal of young people present and. The popes there, of course, they're all high as kites, all singing and dancing, and and uh, you know, top of the world with it all. God bless them. <laughs> so, so, um, yes.